Argentines focused their attention today not on the British advance towards Stanley, but on reports that Argentine pilots had successfully attacked a British carrier. Press accounts in Buenos Aires told of a bomb and missile attack against the British carrier Invincible. This headline reads, Invincible, not for the Argentinians. England has denied that the carrier was attacked. This morning, Argentina's foreign minister, Nicanor Costa Mendez, refused to comment when asked about the carrier attack. The rest of the government was also silent about it. The only official communique issued today spoke of renewed Argentine air attacks against British ground positions. Intelligence experts here believe that the next 24 to 48 hours will be decisive in determining the outcome of the war, as an estimated five to 7,000 Argentine troops dug in around Stanley confront a roughly equal number of British Marines and soldiers. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Buenos Aires. Sixty-one more British soldiers and sailors injured near the end of the war came through the port of Montevideo today. Most had suffered burns when Argentine planes bombed a transport ship. They'll soon be home. In these pictures, obtained exclusively by CBS News, Argentine troops near Stanley are posing for a photographer last weekend. Then, posing gives way to scrambling. A rocket has hit near them. They believe it came from a British plane. They use only this. Officials of the International Red Cross were in Stanley in the war's final days, seeking to minimize carnage among civilians. Nevertheless, this home owned by a Stanley resident was destroyed Friday, Argentina says, by fire from British ships. Two civilians died. As the British prepared for the final assault, Argentine wounded were evacuated from Stanley. The final battleground outside the town offered little cover for troops. British artillery was effective, cratering the landscape so thoroughly that the defenders had to disperse ammunition and other supplies. This army depot fell prey to a British helicopter assault. Argentine troops at an anti-aircraft emplacement can see a British helicopter firing in the hills, but they can't hit it. The contrails are those of Harriers over Stanley. The Argentines had some air defense missiles, but not enough to win control of the air, a crucial factor in the war's outcome. In this one instance, however, the ground crew firing an Argentine missile claimed a hit, saying that distant puff of smoke is a British jet after its destruction. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Buenos Aires. Monday, June 14th and the Argentine hold on Port Stanley is crumbling. It is the last day of the war as captured in pictures obtained by CBS News. British artillery in the high ground surrounding the Falklands capital has been pounding the defenders for days. Except for the smoke of incoming shells, the skies are clear. Yet the Argentine Air Force is nowhere to be seen and the position of the garrison is hopeless. The troops know it. They can hear it. The artillery bombardment sets some homes on fire. A dusting of snow covers the streets as Argentine soldiers patrol in near zero temperatures. According to the cameraman, some were wounded by Kelpers, Falklands residents, who fired hunting rifles at them from their homes. The Argentine cameraman goes out to look for the advancing British and finds them, two paratroopers in a Stanley backyard. He believes they are the first British in the town. They ask an Argentine newsman where Stanley is and are surprised when told they are in it. More British advance, a temporary ceasefire is now in effect. These British officers, escorted by an Argentine MP, the cameraman says, are on their way to negotiate the final surrender. And these fighting men, two British on the left and three Argentines on the right, both groups still armed, encounter each other on a Stanley Street. Such conversations, we are told, always began the same on that day, on both sides. Men said, thank God it's over. 
Eric Engberg, CBS News, Buenos Aires. Thousands of school children on the East Coast are enjoying a day off from school forced by snow and slick roads. The last piece of junk from a dying Soviet satellite came down over the South Atlantic, burning up without hurting anyone. An exhibit of man's accomplishments in flight was visited today by President Reagan, who spoke of America's role in the skies and beyond. Our leadership in the air and space technology, a leadership we're determined to maintain has already provided the American people with a rich bounty that has strengthened our economy and bettered our lives. A leader in the independent truck driver's strike says progress has been made in talks with Washington officials on the driver's demands for tax relief. Federal transportation officials deny they are meeting with the drivers, but say they expect the strike to collapse soon. In Lebanon, the latest ceasefire between Muslim and Christian militias east of Beirut fell apart soon after it was reached. President Reagan's boyhood home in the town of Dixon, Illinois, was damaged by a fire during the night. The home is now a tourist attraction. Officials blamed faulty wiring for the fire. Players now are looking for a way out in private. Congressional investigators looking into charges that dangerous chemical dumps were improperly policed will have to wait until tomorrow to learn how far the White House will go in opening up files of the Environmental Protection Agency. Snow canceled today's meeting between administration officials and the key House Committee chairman. EPA Chief Ann Gorsuch faces a possible criminal prosecution for contempt of Congress if the documents are withheld. There are signs the White House, wary of possible charges of a cover-up, is now backing off earlier executive privilege claims so some files can be opened. It's hard for me to see how anybody is served by my going to jail and or paying a fine of $1,000. The use by the EPA of two new paper shredding machines like these prompted one House chairman to demand that the FBI investigate whether papers under subpoena from the House had been destroyed. We think it's incumbent upon the Attorney General, since this would be a criminal action, for him to have the FBI do two things. Number one, to go over there and protect the documents from the shredder for in the future, and also to conduct what would be a criminal investigation as to what may have or may not have been shredded in the past. It's my understanding that the agency has always had paper shredders, as does every agency in, uh, in Washington. The EPA, which said it removed the shredders after Congress complained, insisted no original documents had been destroyed. House lawyers, however, said duplicates could be just as vital to the investigation as originals. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Washington. Simon Gorsuch, who is facing investigations from five congressional panels, said she had fired one of the agency's top officials. Today, that official said she can't figure out why she was singled out. Eric Ingberg reports. Ending a week of silence, Rita Lavelle said she did not know why she was fired as head of the government's toxic waste cleanup program, that she did nothing wrong and will cooperate with congressional investigations. With her lawyer at her side, she denied claims from opponents that she had let politics dictate the handling of sensitive cleanup cases. As far as I'm concerned, no. And with deep knowledge of the managers that worked for me, that would never enter into their thought process as it never entered into mine. Congressional investigators say some documents they want from her former office were destroyed by shredding machines. I've never used a shredder. I don't know when the shredders got there. It just was not important to me. I was doing other things. Another item Congress is demanding, her appointment calendar, Lavelle says she does have and will hand over. She said some materials, which she described as personal effects, were taken from her office by aides after her dismissal. The Reagan administration, claiming executive privilege, has refused to give Congress some records on toxic dumps. Attempts to reach a compromise, delayed by yesterday's snowstorm, resume today in meetings between White House lawyers and House officials. The uh, House of Representatives has to have complete access to the documents but we, of course, would be willing to take such reasonable steps as may be necessary to protect confidentiality of uh, sensitive documents and assure their security. Investigators say one of the first people to be called in the days ahead to testify on charges the EPA was soft on polluters will be Rita Lavelle. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Washington. John, John Kimbrough, John David Crow, and Jack Pardee no Texas A&M tradition is stronger than that of the 12th man, whose name is Legion. 
This season began with a 1917 loss to California, and Eric Ingberg reports a new tradition for the 12th man. Texas A&M Aggies on the eve of the big game, even more gung-ho than usual because of something new. Ordinary students would be on the gridiron. They had been recruited from the student body, many of them military cadets known for a do-or-die spirit. The coaches had picked 16 students to play on the kickoff suicide squad to, as they put it, sacrifice their bodies for A&M. Well, you can have a kickoff run back anytime. Uh, but I will say this, it won't, it won't be because it's lack of effort. It won't be because somebody's not going down the field getting ready to splatter somebody. I'm going to shake a man up. Hopefully I'll break a couple ribs and shake the ball loose. Ron Reynolds, an engineering student, was typical of the volunteers. Weight, 180. Last played football in high school, too small to attract any college recruiters. And on the eve of the game, butterflies in his stomach. So I haven't slept good in the last week. <laughs> But the 30,000 fans who turned out for the pregame rally were sure the kickoff commandos would meet the test in the opener against California. None had ever played before a crowd like this. 50,000 Texas Aggies who stand throughout the game to show they're ready to go in as the 12th player. Now these young Walter Middies of the gridiron were the flesh and bones of that tradition. They got their first real chance in the second half with A&M behind. And lo and behold, they stopped the Cal runner cold quality kamikaze work. Reynolds was content even without breaking someone's ribs. History will record that Cal went on to win a close game. But a commodity called fun, sometimes rare in sports, dominated this match. And just maybe the real winner was everyone who has ever been told he shouldn't try to play with the big boys. Eric Engberg, CBS News, College Station, Texas. And that's the CBS Evening News for this Labor Day. Dan Rather reporting from New York. Thank you for joining us. Good night. January 1st breakup of the Bell system. As matters now stand, it means new monthly charges and higher rates for local calls, what critics call unfairly high, and what some industry analysts say will more than make up for AT&T's much publicized proposal to cut the cost of long distance calls by $1.75 billion. But that's just the beginning. Eric Ingberg looks tonight at the whole array of changes, choices, and options that will soon affect almost all of us, our phones and our pocketbooks. The days of simplicity, when there was one phone company to do it all, from installation to long distance, will end with the new year. Ma Bell, as we know her, will be dead at the age of 104, and the telephone user will be thrust into a confusing new world. Now we're going to be faced with what I've called an explosion of choice. Choice over such things as do you rent a phone or buy it? Install it yourself or have someone do it? What company to use for long distance? You'll be dealing with a local phone company which keeps the Ma Bell name and with AT&T which keeps the phones. And you can keep on renting them just like the old days. Cost, $1.50 a month for dial, $2.85 for touchtone. What about buying? You can buy those old phones, which in the long run is cheaper. Now you can own it. Own it? How? Pay for it once, and it's yours. You could save money in the long run. Nice. The used price, about $20 for dial, $42 for touchtone. If you want something new, just go to a store. A host of retailers are now pushing everything from Mickey Mouse to Darth Vader and an army of fun phones in between. They range in price from under $10 into the hundreds for special models. As always, buyers should beware. Common sense prevails. Look at the phone. Does it look good? Does it look solid? Uh, does the touch tone sound right? Does it look like it's going to break when your kid drops it on the floor? It's a consumer product. Uh, you have to look at it as if you're buying, buying a blender or a toaster. If you buy new, don't forget to turn in your leased phone at an AT&T store so the rental charge will stop. Installing. That's up to you. If your house has these new model wall jacks, out goes the old phone, in goes the new. The installation is so simple that most people don't believe us when we tell them how easy it is. If your house doesn't have the new plug-in jacks, you can buy them along with a how-to book and make the switch. With the new jack cover, attach the wires to the corresponding color terminals. And when the installation is complete, all you have to do is plug in your phone. 
and it's done. If you can't handle that, AT&T and local contractors will install for a price, generally upwards of $25. Servicing. Warranties are important when buying because if a phone breaks, it will make the most sense to take it back where you got it for repair. AT&T will still make house calls for its own equipment, but it won't be cheap. Local phone companies will fix problems on the phone lines free, but not the phones. The phone book and the yellow pages won't change. They'll be put out by the local phone companies. Have you been talking to our son on long distance again? Long distance. Big changes are coming in long distance, where price wars will rage between AT&T and the smaller competitors which charge less. What on earth are you crying for? Have you seen our long distance bill? <laughs> the new AT&T, free of the expenses of providing local service, will cut long distance rates by 10%. Even so, its competitors, while small, will be given their best chance ever to go after your business because of legal and technical changes starting next year. We tell consumers, shop around. Again, shop around like you're shopping for anything else. Uh, in general, a consumer can start to save money if his phone bill is over $25 or $30 a month. Billing. As always, you'll get a monthly bill from the local company listing AT&T long distance charges separately. If you choose another long distance company, you may get a second bill from it. So there will be a bunch of new phone numbers to learn when you want to complain about the bill. There are sure to be complaints because the cost of making local calls will go up. How high is still being argued before state regulators. In Texas, the phone company wants to triple the local charges from $10.70 to about 28. In several states, the companies want double. But they seldom get all they want from the regulators, who must listen to the public, too. All the changes will take some getting used to. But a visit to the Smithsonian's Museum of American History reminds us that change has marked the entire telephone era. We survived the death of phone exchanges that had real names, like Murray Hill and Idlewood. We survived the loss of friendly voices asking number plios. And experts say we'll survive all this, too. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Washington. Doing, and what they want to do more of, to cut down on overcharging and other forms of military waste of taxpayer money. The latest tactic that seems to be paying off, paying off bonuses to government employees who question and catch overcharges and overpayments. One such whistleblower, in fact, was awarded a $10,000 bonus just this week for calling attention to skyrocketing prices for military spare parts. Correspondent Eric Engberg reports tonight on another military project that could have used a whistleblower instead of a siren. The sirens warn everyone to stay clear. Moments later, detonation. It's the Navy way of getting rid of tons of out-of-date, unusable missile fuel and other dangerous explosives. It happens two or three times a week on this Navy beach in Maryland. No one knows what threat the fumes and smoke pose for nearby residents, but as early as 1970, the Navy knew it was a dangerous way. Solution? Construct a nine-building plant at the Navy Ordnance Station in Maryland, a super-duper high-tech disposal where the explosives would be ground up, passed through miles of pipes and stainless steel tanks, and safely destroyed. Problem solved. Well, no. The problem was they went ahead and let the contract before they knew the process would work. It didn't. So the Navy killed the project and hoped no one would notice. That is, until Senator Roth and his investigators came calling with demands for an explanation. There was $12 million worth of explaining to do. Like how water was left inside the pipes, so when cold weather came, they burst. All of which the contractor on the job had warned about. We found that the place was in shambles. It had been left unmaintained. Control system, which is highly sophisticated, was left uh, with the filters and the air compressors off, which contaminated the complete control system. Then there was the conveyor system, which was supposed to jiggle the ground-up explosives and fuel uphill to a safe demise. When the Navy later tacked on a water sprayer to cool the explosives, it found that trash, unlike salmon, won't swim upstream. Every time it would slide up one notch, it would be washed down too. I can't see how something like that would work. It, it, it won't work. It won't work today. <laughs> it didn't work last year. It didn't work years before. What went wrong here? bad management. It's pure and simple. 
Unfortunately, they let the, the small contractor take the blame. The project dragged on for six years, and the Navy ordered contractor Bond to make 200 changes in the plans, agreed to cover his extra costs, then reneged on the deal. Forced to eat three quarters of a million dollars in losses, Bond wrote the Navy a plaintiff letter concluding, I'm in one hell of a jam. I put my home up for collateral, took all my personal holdings, all the money I could borrow from friends, banks, and everything else, and to put into this company to keep it afloat. The Navy is sensitive about this worthless project. The Secretary of the Navy personally ordered that CBS News cameras be kept out. Senate investigators have found other lemons. We had a captain tell, tell him, one of my investigators, if it doesn't involve $10 million, it shouldn't take 10 minutes of my time. So now what? The Navy has refused to talk to us at all about this project. It is paying a consultant $179,000 to figure out what to do with the disposal plant. And the missile age trash? The Navy burns it on the beach every week, just as it did $12 million ago. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Indian Head, Maryland. But there are exceptions, and some parents complain that some Saturday morning children's cartoon shows are among the exceptions. They claim the commercials and the programs they are in amount to one continuous advertising pitch, taking advantage of unsuspecting children. Eric Ingberg reports on the renewed heat the Federal Communications Commission is taking about this. Faster, gung ho! Get the G.I. Joe Dragonfly Copter! G.I. Joe is the star of his own TV show. A lot of other toys are making it big on TV these days, and not just in commercials, but in regular programs aimed at children and packaged as entertainment. Critics say they're designed to nudge children into buying the products. Someone has to let broadcasters know they cannot get away with turning children's television into the big sell. Sharon's group, Action for Children's Television, charged in a complaint to the Federal Communications Commission that eight kid shows are program-length commercials in the guise of entertainment. Commercial broadcasters and advertisers are working together to deprive children of their rights to TV entertainment and education. The brand new children's TV season is a brand name disgrace. G.I. Joe's creators at Hasbro Industries defended his show, saying it was produced not to push toys, but to satisfy the kids out there who were really asking for it. Mattel withheld comment, but a toy industry analyst said that while toys and programs are sometimes developed jointly, there's nothing sinister in it. I believe it's, it's fair to say that many toy companies have ambitions to uh, producing entertainment for its own sake. If little girls all across America love playing with strawberry shortcake dolls, what's wrong with them watching a TV show with plot lines built around their favorite character? The FCC will now have to decide whether G.I. Joe, Pac-Man, and others are guilty of being commercials. It's not known how long that will take, but don't expect a decision before Christmas. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Washington. As In the year of the I-95 World Series, the mere 104 miles separating Philadelphia from Baltimore, ensure that there will be a hotly contested middle ground, a tense demarcation zone where Oriole magic vies with Philly fever. Appropriately, this land of blurred allegiances begins just above the Mason-Dixon line in the environs of York, Pennsylvania, where even households are divided over which side to be on. Who do you root for? The birds. And you? Gary Maddox. Phillies. But the two of you are married. Right. She can't help it, but she'll get over it. <laughs> we fight about other things, too. <laughs> York may be in Pennsylvania, but a big part of its baseball heart belongs to Baltimore, which is closer. Jim Hoobly, a veteran sports writer, and other York fans still remember how Hall of Famer Brooks Robinson got his start with the farm team the Orioles once ran here. Right here, we're walking on hallowed ground where Brooks Robinson first began to play. And you saw that? I covered the first game he played, yes. He was second base, you know. Later on, he went to third. Hubley, a Phillies fan, knows from no less an authority than his wife that the current Orioles are just as big in his town. Of course, I have my favorites, Ripken. He really produces, and I enjoy watching him. 
You told me he was also handsome. He is handsome. He could be my son any time. <laughs> but the Phil's fans, while outnumbered, are hanging tough. Minister Ed Ziders, determined to knock Oriole dreams into a cocked hat, even delivered a pro-Philly sermon last Sunday. And at the Embers Lounge, hard by the road to Baltimore, partisans of the two teams gathered again last night to heap good-natured abuse on each other. It all goes to prove that where baseball is concerned at this time of the year, there is no middle ground, even on the middle ground. Eric Engberg, CBS News, York, Pennsylvania. In that effort. They were not afraid to stand up for their country or, no matter how difficult and slow the journey might be, to give to others that last... Calls Korea is smaller and partly because it is so directly threatened militarily, U.S. officials are less concerned about the protectionist trade policies there. Eric Ingberg has been traveling in Korea. Hawkeye and his buddies at the 4077th MASH got orders for home as soon as the Korean War ended, and home they went. But in the real world, 39,000 American troops are still on duty in Korea, more than in Grenada, Lebanon, and Central America put together. President Reagan will come to the demilitarized zone, the reality which shapes all U.S. policy in Korea. When you talk of world trouble spots, this is what you're talking about. Here, two armies of two sworn enemies face each other like scorpions, separated only by a narrow strip of land and a few pieces of barbed wire. On the north, the world's sixth largest military power, led by Kim Il-sung, who first invaded the South 33 years ago and has not mellowed with age. Last month, a bomb planted by his agents killed 17 high South Korean government officials visiting Burma. In the South, which has one of the best armies anywhere, soldiers chant, kill, kill Kim Il-sung as they train. The U.S. job here is to keep both sides from starting something that could quickly explode into a great power confrontation. Even factory workers in South Korea stay close to their guns. But it's their work inside the plants that has given the country one of the world's fastest growing economies, first in heavy industry like steel and shipbuilding, and lately in such high-tech items as video recorders. It's gone so well that the U.S. now complains of Korean trade barriers, and the Japanese mutter that Koreans work too hard. These Samsung electronic employees put in a 12-hour day, six days a week, for about $250 a month. Prosperity has helped calm opposition to military rule, which three years ago was so strong that students took over an entire city, Gwangju, for a week before troops crushed the rebellion. Korean government is running military dictatorship. The regime uses the security problem to pressure those who complains. Kim is one of 300 opposition leaders to be barred from all political activity by South Korean President Chun Doo Won, a former general. Chun has widespread support in the countryside where farmers worry more about North Korean guns than democratic values. But there is opposition on the campuses. The people of Korea don't support the Chun government. Police were busy this week arresting and tear gassing student demonstrators who blame the U.S. for befriending a dictator. The growing middle class, children of the economic boom, also want more voice in the politics of a country where rigged elections, repression, and coups have been the norm. Chun has promised free elections in 1988, but has done nothing so far to make that happen. South Korea's leap into the future is a success story, one President Reagan will be stressing here. But American officials fear that it's only part of a story, that minus political reforms, guns pointing north, aren't enough to keep this country secure. Eric Engberg, CBS News, along the DMZ in Korea. If these look like pictures of American troops at the front, that's what they are. Front is the right word, because while there is no war in Korea, there is no real peace either. 
The U.S. maintains 39,000 troops here, including an entire infantry division, kept in fighting trim by constant realistic training exercises. Soldiers at forward outposts, like Camp Roulette, can actually watch the North Koreans watching them from their outposts. Stationed between two countries which hate each other so much they don't allow phone calls or mail to cross the border, the Americans here serve as a tripwire, reassuring the South and warning the North that any new fighting will involve the U.S. A uh, large deterrent military power, which we have made clear will be used. The Americans are generally popular here, and the morale of U.S. troops is high. They train regularly with their South Korean counterparts to ensure close coordination, and some Koreans are even serving in American units. Americans are still on duty near Panmunjom, where the truce was negotiated, and where periodic meetings to discuss violations produce only rhetoric. Here, where the hostile forces are face to face, it is almost as though time has stood still since the armistice was signed 30 years ago. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Panmunjom. And that's the news. I'm Bob Schieffer, CBS News, New York. ...are demanding equal pay, which they haven't had before. And traditions of family life are under attack from an emerging woman's movement, which says wifely subservience, symbolized by the bride's second place status in the wedding march, is no longer acceptable. Nonetheless, the new upwardly mobile Koreans who worship the promise of a modern consumer economy seem ready to walk into the future without a backward glance. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Seoul. Beautiful. Tomorrow on the Morning News, Heart Book.